boop, 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 what's up ladies and gentlemen and welcome to part two of the monster series guide where we're gonna take a look at the four different event boss fights also known as lords explaining their mechanics strengths weaknesses along with a few tips and tricks leading up to the most optimal strategic approach and stay tuned to the very end to see my newly invented next level never before seen bonus tactic <laughs> Your paymasters! They are weak! <laughs> you! Death! <laughs> All will see! All will die, die! First up, we have Purple Spew Hail Scourge, who is a Chaos Monster in terms of his faction and armor class, and I've listed his HP pool by order of game difficulty on the left side, as well as the list of the enemy minions he has the potential to spawn. But before we get ahead of ourselves, there are three key features I want to mention regarding the arena in which we're fighting. The first and most obvious of which is this corner over here. Now, as the only spot in the entire arena with actual protection against this plague wave, this is preferably where you want to place your huntsman, your way stalker, your bounty hunter, your squishy ranged high dps characters and preferably one person to protect them the second thing i want to mention are these bars here now if you're struggling to consistently dodge his plague wave these bars can be a super useful tool to easily visualize your dodge as i will showcase later last but not least should one of your teammates fall this is where they're gonna spawn now as a good rule of thumb for any of these boss fights is the moment you're down to two teammates being alive you want to go full rescue mode meaning your only objective until the rescue is possible is to stay alive group up and move into position for the revive. Now, Hail Scourge has a total of four different attacks. The first and most used of which is Plague Wave. This is a moderate AoE attack and Purple Spew's primary damage dealer. It's a frontal attack that is split into three green magic copies dealing medium damage over time. And though this attack is unblockable, it can however be dodged. Now, obviously this attack is a lot easier to dodge the further away you are. Producing one of these bars makes it significantly easier to time the dodge. This can partly be attributed to your brain, having already subconsciously decided which direction to dodge, due to your positioning relative to the bar. Now, whenever Hail Scourge teleports to the upper levels, you should be aware of enemy minions starting to drop into the map. This is, however, also the position from which he performs his second attack, Possession. Now, this is a single target ranged attack, sending out small black swarms that track and envelop a hero. If it hits, it hinders you from moving or attacking while stealing damage over time. These swarms can be shot or stricken mid-air to destroy them. If one of your teammates has been possessed, simply perform a light attack on your ally to remove the effect. Do note that this attack cannot be blocked. His third attack, which only triggers when he returns from the upper levels, and is essentially equivalent to Plague Wave, his first attack on steroids. Now it deals identical damage to Plague Wave, so the only real difference comes down to the amount of projectiles and the fact that they're shot in all directions rather than a cone. Last but not least, he has a large AoE attack, very similar to that of a Blightstormer, which is always triggered by him teleporting to the middle of the room, upon which he will spawn a Plague Wind that spans the majority of the room, leaving only the edges of the arena safe. With all of his mechanics out of the way, let's get into some gameplay examples. If playing as a Shade, pop your ulti straight away, although this failed due to someone staggering him, causing me to miss my attack, you might as well get your ulti on cooldown as soon as possible. However, this is not the time to use a concentration pot, if you're playing Shade, that is. This is because he'll most likely teleport out of range, and before you even have the chance to reach him, he's gonna teleport away again. Instead, what you should do is ask one of your teammates to defend you the first time he teleports to the upper floor. This is because he's likely to go through several animations before teleporting to a new location. This is going to allow you to get full value from your concentration bot. That is, assuming you have asked your team like I hadn't here, and assuming you aren't retarded at jumping. Like, I clearly was doing this recording. But it really doesn't matter, because even with way below average accuracy on your ultis here, you're still going to get way more ultis in than you would have otherwise, by trying to chase him down between teleports. On Legend difficulty and below, it doesn't take much more than a single bomb and a Kong pot on a high DPS hero to take him out before he even starts spawning minions. 
With a bit of teamwork, this is in fact not as hard as it sounds and can be done even with relatively few headshots. However, do keep in mind that in scenarios where he does start spawning minions, you should preferably focus on clearing out all of the trash unless Hail Scourge is really close to dying. But I think that just about sums up Rebel's few Hail Scourge. Keep your range DPS safe, kill all the trash, and you should have a pretty easy time. Up next we have the one and only Bruce Lee of Storm Vermins, Skerrick Spine Mangler. And just like a Storm Vermin, he's a Skaven Armored, and do notice that he has a significantly lower HP pool than Bribble's Pew. This is because he's heavily armored, meaning you need either high damage armor piercing attacks or critical and or headshots in order to hit through his armor and deal significant damage. However, in order to balance out this low HP pool, he is the most aggressive of all the bosses, and can quickly take out squishy heroes who will revive in this corner that I've marked here. Which is also one of the corners where he goes to spawn minions, so make sure you watch out for that. Now, Skerrick has 8 different attacks and uses 2 different sets of weapons, but all you really need to know is that he always starts off with his dual swords. Now, all of these attacks are blockable, although according to the Brimiton Wikipedia, one of them isn't. But after more than an hour of testing, I couldn't find a single one of his sword attacks that wasn't blockable. He then switches to his Halbart, giving him a completely new set of attacks. Two of which are blockable and two of which aren't, as you just saw there in the form of a jump attack and a sweep. What you saw there was the overhead, which is only partially blockable, meaning it goes through but you take reduced damage. The final unblockable attack you've probably noticed before, it's his heavy sweep that he does whenever he moves into a corner. This is also partially blockable, although this attack is gonna send you flying. In other words, make sure you always block, because otherwise this is what's gonna happen. But really, Skerrick's biggest weakness is still gonna be his low HP pool. Assuming you have one or two players who knows what they're doing on their DPS, you're gonna melt him in no time. A great example of this would be the Bounty Hunter, where you get an easy initiation headshot resetting 80% of your cooldown for a pretty quick finish. The exact same thing can be done with the Shade, and in this case a Strength Pot, removing half of his HP before the fight has even started. Now it's really important that you get those headshots in early on. Due to his armor class, the difference between shooting him in the head and shooting him on the body is absolutely massive. And getting that damage in early on before you have to worry about a bunch of minions hitting you in the back is absolutely crucial for an easy boss fight. Or you can just have a bounty hunter on your team and absolutely shred him to pieces with absolutely no skill required whatsoever. Now, if for whatever reason you're unable to burst him down in the beginning, fighting Skerrick isn't all that different from fighting a Chaos Spawn or a Minotaur in the midst of a horde. The same rules apply. Someone takes Acro and keeps him occupied while everyone else clears and tries to DPS him from behind. As soon as you lose Acro, the tables turn and you'll start to deal DPS. Now, do watch out for the range on his heavy sweep attack. It has a really long and really easy to spot animation upwind, but once it hits, it does so in a big area. Now, as long as you know how his heavy sweep attack works, he's actually fairly easy to DPS while in the corner. If you have a hero like Handmaiden or Saltspire sell it with a decent HP pool left, sometimes the best course of action can be to go behind him and simply eat the damage from blocking his heavy sweeps in order to get value from something like in this case a strength pot. But I think that's just about all there is to say about this guy. He's one of the fairly easy lords to fight, so uh, without further ado, let's move on. Up next we have Budvar Rip Spreader. Now, as you could probably figure out on your own, Bodvar is a Chaos Armored in terms of his faction and armor class. And like Skerrick Spine Mangler, he's fully armored, meaning unless you headshot him, you need heavy armor piercing attacks, otherwise you're not gonna deal any damage whatsoever. And he's basically just a beefed up Chaos Warrior. Now, the two only really noticeable features about the arena is the spawn location, as I noted with the red arrow here, and the fact that minions spawn from three out of the four sides, not including the site you came from which is probably the single most important fact about this boss fight, but we'll get to that in more detail in a minute. Now, Budvar has a bunch of different attacks, neither of which I'm going to explain in any detail. Why is that? Well, not only is every single one of his attacks fully blockable, 
but you could teach an underdeveloped potato to learn his attack sequence in five minutes. I mean seriously, look at this. Wait. Barely even trying. Na, 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 na. I swear to god, Bolivar, you couldn't hit water if you fell out of a boat. No, wait, I can do better. You couldn't scratch a clan rat in the middle of a horde. No, no, wait, wait, I got one more. You couldn't avoid hitting thin air if you were striking from the surface of the freaking moon. Oh yeah, also, any attack that you block is gonna send you flying, like so, including his ranged boomerang attack. Obviously. Yeah, right, as if. But right, you couldn't take out a wounded ranger dwarf with no melee weapon who ran out of ammunition. No, but really, the key here is to place your ranged DPS on the side from which you came, since all minion spawns are gonna come from the three other sides. That way, you're guaranteed that nothing is gonna hit you in the back, and then preferably, you wanna have a melee or two protecting either side of your primary ranged DPS. Pretty much exactly like what's going on here, because that way I can just keep shooting without a single care in the world and hopefully knock it through his thick helmet and even thicker skull so he can understand how pathetic he is. He is in fact so pathetic that I entirely voluntarily and totally 100% on purpose without accident by my own free will <coughs> chose to kill myself in this uh, no respawn deed <coughs> just so my two teammates could show him just how pathetic he is. Yes, yes, that, that, that was why. That is precisely what happened and exactly how I remember it. Now that we have it established as fact that I am dead only because I wanted to be dead. <coughs> Let's take a look at how my teammates, both of whom are really experienced Vermintide players, handle this two-man boss fight like a breeze. First thing to notice here is that they are clearing up all the trash. This is an absolute must when you're only two people, otherwise it's just gonna start to build up and you're not gonna be able to effectively damage Botmar. And look how as soon as he's on the wizard, the wizard is being really really defensive, because she doesn't have to be aggressive. Instead by letting Handmaiden attack, He's gonna let Handmaiden get the acro, which is obviously the optimal scenario, both because Handmaiden has a lot more mobility, but also because as a pyromancer with a bolt staff, you're able to dish out way more heavy armor damage. So having acro on the elf is preferable. And I mean, not to take any credit from my teammates whatsoever, because they did beautifully, but just notice how easy this boss fight actually is. The fact that you can block every single attack, like neither of them were even hit once during the entire fight, which is well played, but it would have been absolutely amazing on this next boss, which let's be honest, is the reason 99% of you are here. So I'm gonna need someone to speed dial James Cameron, cause we're gonna need one serious submarine for this strategic deep dive. Now, Death Rattler is a Skaven monster, and it's basically just a Storm Fiend with gunners attached instead of a flamethrower. Raskman, however, is an unarmored Skaven infantry, unlike any of the other lords. Now, in order to ensure that everyone understands this, I've gone full retard on my strategic animation capabilities. Now, this is the arena in which we will be fighting. Now, the three green dots mark the respawn location, while the bottom white dots marks the guaranteed ammunition pickup as well as the potential potion or bomb spot, while the top white dot is potential healing. Now, these two yellow circles represent the two primary DPS dealers, both of which should have proper and precise range DPS. Now, this horribly drawn cross represents where the boss is gonna start. And one of the first things you want to do is acro the boss out to the center, now represented by a black circle. Enemy minion spawns, including monks and storm vermins, are gonna enter the map from four different locations, which is where player 3 and 4 comes into the picture, marked here by blue dots. Now it's their job to prevent minion spawns from reaching the DPS, and prevent damaging death rattle at all costs, as he will otherwise acro on them and screw up the entire structure. Now the idea here is that yellow dot 1 and 2 are gonna swap the acro between Death Rattler by primarily taking turns on shooting him in the controller, whilst having both good vision and distance to the enemy entry spot. This should, hopefully, prevent anyone from accidentally getting stabbed in the back. Now, just to be very, very, very clear, I'm not saying that this is the only way to do it. I am also not saying that this is necessary to do it, or that if you follow the strategy, you should never deviate from it. The point I'm trying to get across here is more about the overall team structure. Keep in mind that many of these roles can be fluent, you don't have to be either blue or yellow dot. 
a hero like the elf might very well find herself having to play either role at different times throughout the fight. This is also way stronger for the team as a whole, as it allows you to adapt your strategy depending on your situation. Even if only two people were left standing, you would still preferably want to swap the aggro and keep Death Rattler in the middle, otherwise he's gonna force either one of you out from your cover. This is gonna make the entire fight chaotic and unpredictable, resulting in a scenario where no one can really do anything efficiently. You can't damage Death Rattler due to a constant flow of minions in your back, and you can't effectively clear out minions because you have no consistent cover from Death Rattler. Last thing before we move on would be to say that this is a highly efficient strategy if you're trying to finish the Legend or Kata challenge where you have to kill Rasknit in 20 seconds after killing Death Rattler. Now once you kill Death Rattler, Rasknit is going to teleport to the top right corner and continue in an entirely predictable pattern, following roughly the shape of an hourglass. Now the mistake many people make is try to chase him around from spot to spot, but being unable to ever really catch up with him. And so the idea here is to go where he's going to be rather than where he is. If we have our four players, two on each side, the most logic approach is to alternate between either top right and left or bottom right and left. This will allow you to take turns damaging Rasknit, leaving a time gap just large enough for you to alternate between one spot and the other. This way you're always gonna arrive a second or two before him, allowing you to prepare your attacks better whilst also ensuring that he can't attack, because every time he teleports away, someone's already waiting for him at the new location. Now, this is probably the single most important thing to take away from this guide. Not following this strategy is going to put you in a situation where Rasnet is allowed to constantly shoot and deal damage, only for a player to reach him, deal a tiny amount of damage, upon which he will simply teleport away, forcing the player to repeatedly chase after him whilst being bombarded, causing the fight to not only be significantly longer than it has to be, but also way more risky. Which is just completely unnecessary, as this strategy technically only requires two people and is really really easy to follow. Anyways, I hope that all makes sense, so let's move on to some gameplay examples. Now, while Rasklind is mounted on top of Death Rattler, he has a magical shield that negates all the attacks. But prior to killing Death Rattler throughout the fight, Rasklind is gonna fall off up to a total of three times, although this number will vary depending on how careful you are with your damage dealing. But regardless, as soon as he does fall off, you wanna focus all of your DPS solely on Rasklind. This is because unlike after you kill Death Rapper, at this stage of the fight, he's not gonna teleport away, which allows you to utilize the maximum value for, let's say, a Kong Pot on a Shade. Whereas in the second part of the fight, you might only get one, two, or at best three ultis in before he teleports away. Now, although it isn't strictly necessary to win the fight, this approach is by far the most optimal. Now, upon reaching either a time, damage, or stack limit, Rasnid is gonna teleport back and mount Death Rapper again. Now, how many windows of attack you obtain on Rasknit before killing Death Rapper comes down to how careful you are with your damage dealing on Death Rapper. And while it's not necessary to win the fight, it is, however, absolutely 100% necessary to successfully obtain the Legendary or Cataclysm Challenge, in which you have to kill Rasknit within 20 seconds of killing Death Rapper. But for more on that specifically, I'm gonna link a playlist in the description showcasing the completion of these challenges on Cataclysm. But to be specific, what you wanna do to obtain these attack windows is shoot him directly in the controller as much as possible, whilst avoiding too much damage that isn't directly in the controller. Because even if you're not doing the challenges, this is gonna set Rasknit's HP as low as possible prior to engaging the hardest part of the fight. Now, as always, the issue with a lot of these strategies often comes down to playing quick play and not being in control of your team's strategic course of action, in which case to optimize your win rate, I would suggest, firstly, being the player sacrificing damage output to ensure that your teammates get resurrected as quickly as possible by positioning yourself in this corner here, as that's always going to be the most important part of not wiping. Furthermore, even if your team isn't following the hourglass strategy, you can still optimize your own damage output by always going to where you know he's going to be. And if you find yourself with low HP in a scenario where you feel uncomfortable, you should stop worrying about damaging the boss and start worrying about killing ads in order to generate temp HP while simultaneously making it both safer and easier for your remaining teammates to worry about damaging Rasknet. And try to be smarter than him, and remember that once he goes into his death animation, you're really not in a hurry to kill him unless you're doing the challenge, and should thus focus on clearing the remaining enemies, rather than dying like a fucking scrub because you want the killing blow. Yeah, 
not not my proudest moment. Also a quick tip, plenty of heroes have enough mobility that if you just commit to dodging sideways non-stop, you should be able to entirely avoid his gunfire. Theoretically, that is. Also, you should avoid using low damage high stagger attacks, such as the left click from Sienna's beam stuff, as dealing a near irrelevant amount of damage just isn't worth it in relation to triggering his remount or teleport animation. This can however be used to your advantage. In scenarios where Rasknet is in an undesirable and hard to reach corner with no one nearby, the beam stop is fantastic for intentionally triggering his teleport in order to move him to a favorable location with a teammate nearby. But I know what you're thinking. Party now, is that really all you got? Here we all were, thinking you were a tryhard. And all you got is some boring strategies related to mechanics and positioning, and god forbid it teamwork but ain't no need to worry i got you homie this isn't vermintide oh i tried it's motherfucking vermintide amplified so without further ado let me present as promised the 400 iq never before seen super over the top next level military grade tactical strategy right after a quick word from our sponsors Whee! That's right, I am the only sponsor of this video, which is why you should totally support me by liking, commenting, and subscribing. Science isn't about why, it's about why not! At least I would very much appreciate if you do so. And if you're still not convinced... KABOOM! That's right, so subscribe now, because... SCIENCE! And you know, dolphins and stuff. Anyways, where was I again? Oh yeah, the 400 IQ never before seen, super over the top next level, military grade tactical strategy. Step 1, position yourself at the gate. Step 2, push Death Rattler towards the gate, like so. Step 3, push Rastlet off Death Rattler. Step 4, position yourself in the right angle. Step 5. Be a FUCKING GENIUS! And stack a rasknet all the way into the hole. Eventually pushing him out of the arena. And watch as he goes POOF! And he's gone. But better yet, all his minion spawns are gone. But how do you ask? Well, it's this thing you might have heard of called magic. Who's the fucking wizard now, Sienna? I'd like to see you cast that spell. Has it ever occurred to you that I'm just too damn good? You have my permission to clap now. <laughs> Obviously, I'm just kidding. I mean, there's no way my ego could be that enormous. On a serious note though, I really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video, even more so than usual. I don't know if you guys can tell, but I've put a lot of extra time and effort into optimizing, scripting, streamlining my guides better, and really go that extra mile to add some flavor and make them more enjoyable to watch. What I'm trying to say is I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments. Thoughts, questions, criticism, or even just a pointless virtual high five to further boost my ego. All are much appreciated. I love you guys, stay awesome, peace out. The sweet taste of victory. <laughs>